you, you can tell it's early in the semester if y'all are clapping. That's funny. Um, I'm in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology. I'm actually a trained sociologist, not anthropologist. Um, and uh, I have several different research uh, and teaching areas that I do. What we're going to be talking tonight about are two components that, especially this first week, are important for you. One is identity. Uh, and the other is competition. And as sociologists, we pay attention to both of these concepts. How do we shape an identity? What does that mean? How do we interact with others based on that identity? Um, and then how do we compete in a variety of ways? And how does our identity either feed that competition or how does it hinder how we compete for certain things? Um, so, Dean Steinmack told you a couple of things. Uh, he told you that I am his wife. That is um, part of my identity. How is, can you imagine how being a dean's wife and also being a faculty member on campus can sometimes provide two very different identities? Really, nobody? <laughs> there. Not what? Not answer. Yeah. <laughs> Y'all didn't even hear the, these are not honor students. Where did you send me? <laughs> How can you imagine that my identity as dean's wife and my identity as professor at the same university may produce some different realities from time to time? Different authorities, different authorities absolutely. Um, in one way, He's not my dean. My portfolio doesn't go to him. He doesn't review it. Right. On the other hand, I am actually an honors faculty member. I have taught for years um, in the honors college. Last semester, I actually taught two honors classes. I'm teaching one this semester. Um, published in honors, gotten awards, all that kind of stuff. So I'm legitimately an honors faculty member. And in that way, he is my dean. I do have to answer to him in some of those, uh, those ways. Absolutely. What else? Yeah, people treat me differently. I uh, have some people in here who are in my honors social problems class this semester. And I was very careful to say on the first day, just so you know, I'm also the dean's wife. And I say that because every once in a while, I have a student who says, oh, Dean Steinmack. And I go, yeah? What you got? <laughs> tell me. So I tell my class, you're welcome to tell me anything you want. And it'll probably come up at the dinner table. And you can ask Dean Steinmack from time to time. I, I vouch for my students and I beg on their behalf. But it is awkward when first you say something and you don't know that we're married. Can you imagine how that goes halfway through the conversation? <laughs> right, when I have to stop somebody, I'm gonna let you continue, but before you do, there's just a little something I have to tell you, right? <laughs> or I don't say anything, and a month later they see us together somewhere, and then they ask someone, and I look over and I see, Right? And that's when they found out uh, that I'm his wife. We're actually in the same college. We're both in College of Sciences. He's a geologist and I'm a sociologist. And so there are times when we're on committees together. Um, we were on a, uh, sitting at a committee meeting one day. And, and I didn't change my name when we got married. We've only been married um, three and a half years. And so it's been kind of interesting. We kept our dating very quiet on campus. We didn't let anybody know that we were dating. It's a tiny Peyton place. Y'all find that out later. Uh, when y'all start dating everybody on campus, and then everybody, you'll know. Um, and so we didn't tell anybody. And so after we got married, not everybody knew we were married. You don't think to, ta-da, you know, tell everybody. And we were sitting in a meeting, and I leaned over and said something. And we don't even always sit next to each other. And I sat over, and I leaned over, and I said something, and he said something back, and I said something. And somebody across the room said, oh, we'd probably only been married, what, about a year? And uh, one of the other deans leaned over and said, oh, aren't they cute, the little lovebirds? So the people that didn't know we were married over on this side of the room, what do you think their reaction was? Some confusion. We had a couple that were so excited 
about the scandal that was about to ensue. <laughs> they knew about this affair before some other people. They were very excited. They're all over there, and I'm just laughing, right? Finally, somebody said, yeah, no, it's not that cute. They're married. <laughs> Wasn't that cute, right? This idea of identity, of being someone's wife, someone's husband, being a professor, um, are multiple identities. Now, in this particular, when I'm on campus, I have to have a lot of identities. Not only am I John's wife, and that comes up from time to time, um, I get messages, hey, can you tell John, sure, whatever, I'll have to write that down. He's got an email like me, why can't you just tell him, right? I'm also a professor, I have things to do on campus. I'm also a researcher. And so, in the midst of me being in the middle of this great idea in my office, frantically trying to complete my research, there's a knock on the door and somebody says, I need my pen number, I need to drop a class, right? So we have to shift these identities quite often. Now people interact with me based on my identities in the same way that they interact with you based on your identities. So I want you to take a moment to think about, and if you have something to write with, not everyone does, uh, I want you to write down one word that you think summarizes your primary identity. He's keeping it all up here. He's good at that. <laughs> what? Um, I don't think so. The what? I, I wouldn't know. You can ask if they need a binder for the class. Yeah. No. One word. It got really loud. Were y'all asking the person next to you what your identity was? Oh, that's a, that's just a sad moment. If you had to go, no, really, who am I? To the person next to you. Was there some debate about which one you should use? Yeah? Why would you have to ask somebody else? Because I know some of you did. Well, do you think I should put this? Or you should put this? Hard to define yourself. It's what? Kind of yourself. It is kind of hard to define yourself. And don't we depend to some extent on how other people define us? So you found, you came up with one word, but would everybody use that same word to define you? Is that the word your mom would use? I, that just made six of you giggle. I don't even know what your mom would use, but. <laughs> It is totally not whatever is written on your paper. I, now, I, now I just want to know what those six are. Well, did you have trouble narrowing it down? Yeah. When we have that one identity, we actually in sociology refer to that as a master status. That it is um, the identity that controls most of your thought, most of your time, and it is how you are most likely to interact in the world. And so I tell my classes, when we talk about status, I have a lot of statuses. If you actually had to sit down and write every status or every position that you hold in society, every identity that you have, you would run out of paper. Right? You're a student, son, daughter, niece, nephew, registered voter, licensed vehicular driver, pet owner, athlete. Right? Consumer. You could just keep going and keep going and keep going. But there's probably one that is going to drive most of your life over the others. And I tell my classes, while I think of myself as a teacher, if there's a knock, I have a child who is under the age of 18 and who lives with me. And so if there's a knock at the door and they say it is an emergency with your son, 
class is canceled. I am out of there. I have to be, by law, that has to be my master status. I have to be there for him. And so until he's 18 on his own or we cut him loose or he officially divorces us before then or whatever else happens, that has to be my master status to some extent. Right. Now, I also said that I identify myself as a teacher. So if I use the term teacher for my identity, and when people ask me what I do, I typically say teacher because I don't say professor. And that's because of the very nature of the words. I like to think I spend more time teaching than I do professing. You will have instructors that spend more time professing than they do teaching. They may have better things to profess than I do. Maybe that's why we have that distinction. But how we see what we do is going to play into that identity to some extent. So what were some of the identities that you have? Student. Student. And do you play out that identity every day? <laughs> I, everybody nodded except about six people. Well, not every day. I take Thursday off. <laughs> do you have to wake up and remind yourself that you're a student some days? Those are the same people nodding, by the way. <laughs> yes, on Tuesday, I definitely have to remind myself. What all goes into that identity of student? Constantly learning. Constantly learning. So should it stop when you're not a student anymore, or are we talking about being a student for life? Student for life. Student for life. I still learn stuff all the time. What else? Do people interact with you in a different way because you have the identity of student? Certainly do. They can treat you very differently based on the fact that you're a student. There are places you're going to get a better discount than I do. Because your ID card says student, not faculty. So I don't get 10% off. I know, I'm sad about it too. What else? Person, and how does that play out in your identity? Yeah, I'm a person just like everyone else, so I should treat everyone else differently. So an equalizing factor in that way, right? To put Terran as your identity, that you're, um, you're simply a dweller on Earth and you share it with others. What else? Um, I said I was a writer. Writer, okay. So if that's how you identify, and so my guess is that even when you're not writing, you're thinking about what you might be writing or how that experience might go into writing, how it might add to your writing. Yeah? I had somebody ask if student athlete was one word, no, but this is an interesting identity, and I know we have a lot of student athletes in the room. Um, I absolutely hate that phrase, student athlete. Anybody know why it annoys me? Two identities. Two identities. I'm okay with more than that. Yeah, it's the way that we define that. You're you're not the necessarily the student of that athletic competition, right? Or it diminishes the fact that you're a student. Right? I used to teach at a D1 school, and I had a guy who came in fall semester. He played football, um, and he came in in November. I hadn't seen him since September, by the way, except for tests that he hadn't done well on. And he came in, and he said, season's over. I have to get good grades. And I said, where were you the rest of the time? I found it so frustrating. And he said, the only way, the only way I get to go to college is on a full ride scholarship. My parents can contribute absolutely nothing to it. This is a kid who walked around with a Walkman that had no batteries or CDs, but at least everybody thought he was listening to music. He couldn't afford CDs and he couldn't afford batteries. And he said, I have to do nothing but football during that season because I can't do more than one thing at a time. A lot of my teammates can. I can't. 
and in November, then I have to frantically try to make up my classes, and I work my tail off and take my hard classes in the spring. This was a kid who was struggling. He couldn't do both of those things at the same time. It was very difficult for him. So having those identities together were his only potential for success in that particular way. Right. We play different ones at the different times. And you're going to figure out. There's going to be a week when you have a big paper due, but there's also a great party or some event you want to go to, and your mom's going to call and say it's your grandmother's 80th birthday and you need to be there. And all at the same time, you're kind of uh, experiencing all of these identities. And you have to pick which one you're going to be loyal to in that particular way. Now, how many of you identify yourself as an honor student? How, how many of you think of yourself as an honor student? We're going to use, I like the y'all can count. Yes, two words. Not on your paper, but I mean just in general. Do you think of yourself as an honor student? Yeah, sometimes. And what does that mean to you, to be an honor student? Smarter. Smarter. Think differently. Think differently. Take the extra step. Take the extra step. Higher expectations of just you or others? How many of you have told other people at school that you're an honor student? How does that, how do you do that? How do you start that conversation? How else? <laughs> now, that was the part that interested me was the emphasis, honors English, right? How many of you is that your lead-in? Hi, I'm Dave. I'm an honor student. <laughs> no one, even if your name's not Dave? Why are, that's a big deal. I know at least half of your mothers are saying that about you when they talk to other people. Right? Am I lying? People they don't know know you're an honor student. Right? The cashier at the grocery store? Yes. <laughs> Her pedicurist? Cousins she hasn't talked to in years, but she thought she should call them up and let you know that you're in the honors college? <laughs> she is wearing that out, whether you are or not. So how many of you are hesitant to tell people at EAU that you're an honor student? Yeah. Why might you be hesitant to say that? Won't believe it. Won't believe it. <laughs> Stereotypes? I think that just because you're an honor student, you're going to be kind of some smug jerk who's going to rub it in their face. Yeah. And it's not like, I, I don't know. We had one last year. I was pretty sure did. I said, how do you, when you say I'm an honor student, what goes with that? And what he said was, I'm an honors, bitch. <laughs> Shouted it from the back row. He's lovely. <laughs> so it may be that you use it. There may, are there opportunities when you are anxious to slide in that you're an honor student and maybe there's a little uh, to whoever you're talking to about it? Is it maybe somebody that's doubting your competencies and you just feel like they need to know that while at this moment you're not the smartest one in the room, the potential is there? Right? I mean, we all have those moments. My kids are hilarious. They, they're surrounded. Their dad, their stepdad, myself all have terminal degrees. And there are still moments where we cannot accomplish whatever specific task is in front of us. And you can hear my kids walk behind me and go, PhD? I don't think so. <laughs> Just keep going. And I'm like, no, really? I have the diploma. Right? The way that identities play out and who we are. Now, we also talked about. Um, how other people see us. Maybe we have trouble picking that identity. We have a theorist in sociology, uh, had, he's dead, Cooley, who argues the concept of the looking glass self. And he said, how we identify ourselves, how we think of ourselves, is actually a three-parter. 
that first we consider how we think other people see us. So that's the first thing. And then we interpret what that means. So if you think somebody sees me in this situation as an honor student and they think I'm going to be that smug jerk, right? And they say the third part of that is our reaction to what that interpretation is. So if we don't want them, if we don't want people to think that that's who we are, then we are less likely to bring about that identity, right? Now, part of what Cooley is saying is that our identity of self is something that's reflected in others, right? This idea of the looking glass self. We also have some sociologists, though, that say we pick and choose our identities. Some of them we earn. Honor student is certainly one that you had to earn. What all did you have to do to become a university honor student at EIU? You had to have the GPA? ACT? Take the hard classes? Not necessarily. Class rank? There's some people with great GPAs that never took a hard class. Okay, y'all just, what? <laughs> Who are they? <laughs> we want to know. We are hunting them down. You also had to apply, right? How many of you in here did Dean Simon call and say, oh, we are so, we have heard about you? And we want you in our college. I know you don't know me. We're in Illinois. But somebody slipped me your name and number, said, call me maybe. <laughs> and we want to give you an opportunity to be in the Honors College. Yeah, I think at least somebody would go, that was me. <laughs> you had to apply. You, you looked for that. You looked for that as an identity. You tried for that. Not everybody got that. Not everybody got in. Not everybody got some of the scholarships you got. Not everybody got what you were looking for and they were looking for at the same time. So how we play out in this sense of identity, some of these we seek. But aren't there also other identities that we get without wanting them? Aren't there some that are kind of hoisted upon us? Because what else are honor students often called? And I will tell you more so in elementary, uh, middle school, and high school than they are in college. Nerd. Nerd. Right? How many of you embrace that one? Oh, I'll take it. Right? If nothing else, it's a cool candy. We'll take it. What else? What's the cause? Yeah. Snooty? You don't even have to be smart to have that one. Brainiacs? Smart kids? Teacher's pet? They're rolling out now, aren't they? We've got a little flashback coming from high school right now. <laughs> Start getting louder and faster as we go. Right? Gift of maniacs, that's one I, I heard when I study gifted and talented uh, high school children. So. It's always interesting to see some of the things that I hear in the school. So did you fight with any of those labels? Did you work against any of those labels? Anybody in here ever take the opportunity to play dumb at some point because it benefited you? Sure. If it's going to play out for you in that way. And it kind of works, doesn't it? Because then people lower their expectations. And then just when they're least expecting it, you can. Surprise them. Be fabulous. They didn't see it coming. Right. So what labels do we choose and which ones do we not choose? And how do we decide how we're going to play those labels out? How hard is it to change an identity that you've been given? It can be, can be super hard sometimes. It can be extremely difficult. First of all, you have to kind of come to some sense of what that identity is. And then you have to figure out whether you do like it or not. And then you have to fight against it. This is one of the coolest things about going to college. You get to start over. You get to decide what your new identity is going to be. You are not surrounded by the 300 people you went to high school with anymore. You get to reintroduce yourself, except apparently this section. <laughs> Do you all go to high school together? 
then if somebody in this group decides to pick a new identity, don't rat them out. <laughs> Let them go with it. Don't tell the stories from high school. That's just mean. I mean, to yourselves, that's fine. It'll be funny, but not to others, right? You get to start over. You get to pick who you are. You'll have new teachers. You'll have new classmates. You'll have new friends. You'll have new experiences. You will get to pick all of those things. Uh, so now is when you have to start making choices all over again about who you're going to be and what identity you're going to select in that particular way. So the next thing I want you to do, uh, you have your identity where you are now, I want you to write down five things. Let me make sure I get the wording right. Five things in your life that you value. And then I want you to prioritize them, rank them one to five. The things that are the most, and it doesn't have to be things, it can be people, it can be experiences. What is it that is most important to you? Top five. Any got anybody get stuck on four? <laughs> Sometimes you get you, the the first ones crank out. Mm, you have to fit the others in in the end. Now imagine how you can plan what you do at EIU. That's going to pay service to those five importances in your life. What you do at Eastern, will it feed those five things that are important to you? If one is career success, will what you seek here pay to serve that particular goal? That's, if that's something that's important to you. Friends, if friends made that top five, how do you balance friend with all of the work that you're going to have to do while you're here and other opportunities? family. Some of you um, may not have been able to get out of the house fast enough and away. Some of you may have some trouble the first few weeks that you're gone. If you're very close with your family, if you're used to doing things, how do you maintain those relationships if you're gone for four years or if you're looking at grad school, law school, medical school, how do you maintain those relationships when you're gone even longer? How do you choose what is going to feed that list of identities that's important to you and those, those goals or important valuable things that are in your life? How do, you, how do you make those things happen? Well, part of what you have to do is in terms of competition. And one of the things that identities do uh, is empower us, right? How does being an honor student empower you at Eastern? What do you get that others don't get? That is always the number one answer. I think that's the only reason any of you sign up to be in honors. You didn't know that? I'm impressed somebody signed up to be in honors without even knowing that. Yes, you get to get classes before anybody else. Yes! I definitely did not. This is a banner day for you. You learned all kinds of things you didn't know before. You should have brought something to write that down with. <laughs> scholarships. There are scholarships that are available just to you. Money that other people can't get. What else? Smaller This being the exception. I know. We always think it's funny. We, we tell you about these smaller class sizes, and the first one you're required to take has over 100 people in it. It's a better addition to a resume. It is a better addition to a resume. Absolutely. Higher education. 
Higher education by higher, higher education to some extent, right? The expectations are greater in the classes, or they certainly should be. Not that you do more work or harder work, that you do more thoughtful work, more productive work in your honors classes. Right? So just by getting that one identity, you're getting some empowerment in some places that other people aren't. Right? But do we also have identities that can limit us? Absolutely. What kinds of identities limit us then? Yes. There's our departmental honors for theater. Why isn't there? There should, there should be. There is. There is. I'll talk to you after class. Okay. I love that we're all learning stuff tonight. Yeah. What, so while theater is not a label that's going to impede you, at least in that way, what, what might, let's go back to athletes. Does athlete ever impede? Does it ever work against you? Yeah, in what way? Sometimes the teachers don't like athletes. It's time consuming. It is time consuming. And so if you are, and you're playing on behalf of the school, it's something you're doing for the school, for that name, right? But it is time consuming. It's going to take a, a chunk out of what you're doing, right? Teachers may treat you differently, professors instructors may treat you differently because you're an athlete. I, I know people at Eastern that will not send back grade checks to the athletic department. I don't care. They're a student like everybody else. I don't think anybody should be tracking their grades. I won't do it. They won't meet with athletes in terms of recruitment. Won't have anything to do. We should remove all athletics. It should just be gone from the university. You will have some professors that may feel this way. Absolutely. Those are not the ones to constantly use the examples in class. I'm an athlete, so, or is it? You have to make that choice about whether you're willing to go out on that limb or not. You may bring some great examples that nobody else would, certainly no other athlete would have the, the courage to say in that particular class. Okay. In terms of competition, something, I am not from the Midwest, but here is something that I've learned about Midwestern students. You like to compete, but you don't like to look like you're competing. What is that about? <laughs> Why? Many of you nodded at me. What's that about? Nothing but gravy, if you didn't have your heart set on it anyway. And y'all are very polite about competition. No, you first. No, you. Go ahead. Go ahead. Now I'll beat you. <laughs> right? So how do you go about competing for the identities that you want? And you are not new to this competition. There are some of you in here that wanted that class rank that you ended up with. You fought for it. You are used to competing for it. You know about competition, but it is something that you continue to have to work with throughout your life and how you're going to compete. Right? And there are different ways to compete. Sometimes we compete directly with one another. And you may have classes here at Eastern where the grading scale is a competition. I, I had a professor who said, there are 15 people in the room. Here is a bell curve. This is how many A's there will be. This is how many B's, C's, D's, and F's. You fight it out amongst yourselves. All I do is record it. And so you may have had a 78 in the class, but if it was the lowest, it was an F because of that scale. Right? This is something interesting, and I'm sure you all talk about this when you talk about deviance, but something that's really interesting at Eastern that drives me absolutely nuts is that people don't turn cheaters in. I shouldn't have told you that. Now you're going to want to cheat. They, they don't turn cheaters in. They always say, no, it's not. Can you imagine why somebody wouldn't turn cheaters in? And don't look at me like that. I study high school. I know you all didn't turn it in high school either. 
Yeah, it is a lot of paperwork. And then you have to ask, well, you, are you going to come to the session? The board is going to meet. We're going to need you to talk, right? No, I just, uh, right? So are you, we may be less likely to turn somebody in who is cheating on a test. What about plagiarized on a paper? Why might you think we hear from people who say, well, that's their own business? Uh, you don't want to be up to snitch. Yeah. What if you're in that class where the grades are ranked? <laughs> you should have seen, everybody's face just went, oh, no. <laughs> Going down. It's my A. Class of 18, do the math. Only two A's in that class, and one of them has my name on it. I don't care who you are, I'm going to turn you in. Right? Competition is different depending on the context. What I do hear from students is, well, I don't turn them in in class unless it's one where they're ranked in class. And I say, well, what if it's on the job? Oh, I'll turn them in on the job. No doubt. If it's going to look like I'm the one who met, oh, yeah, they're going down. And I'm not going to get our productivity. If, you're, if you have a job where productivity defines your bonus, you're going to turn somebody in if it's going to affect the money in your hand? Yeah. We're good capitalists. We like money. Yeah, I'll turn you in. Right? So the way that we include competition. Well, I have, a, like I said, I have a 15-year-old son. When he was young, he started a new school. They had a new cafeteria. And he came home one day. He does not like pickles or olives. That is relevant, I swear. Um, and, and he came home and he said, you don't need to make my lunch. And I said, OK, why not? And he said, because I'm going to eat off the olive cart. <laughs> Just olives? For, how, what does that cost? I don't even know. What is the olive cart fee these days? I, I'm unaware of that. Two weeks. We heard about him eating off of the olive cart. And every time you would ask him, he is also not one that shares information readily. And so we'd say, what you don't, I just, I had lunch, okay? Right? <laughs> you don't need to know. Lunch, I'm not full. But I need a snack. But I had lunch, don't worry about it. I'm like, how many olives do you have to eat to not be starving at the end of school? So we went through this over and over and over again. Really specific questions. Buddy, what does the olive cart look like? <laughs> right? And so I get, oh, you know what's coming. You have a PhD. You don't know what the olive cart looks like? <laughs> My PhD is not on olives, buddy. I don't, I don't know what this thing looks like. It turns out that when you hit this school, you no longer have to buy the single tray lunch, but you can order a la cart. <laughs> not olive cart. I guess if you're nine, it sounds the same, however. But a la carte. So he was eating a la carte all this time. We didn't know about it, which produces a very different picture of lunch in your head <laughs> than olive cart. And so this is the advice that I give to all college students, but especially to incoming freshmen, is how do you select what goes on your olive cart? What are you going to put on your olive cart? Because you get to pick and choose. That's the part that's really interesting. You get to pick your classes. You have some required classes that you have to take. But you to take a lot of electives here that can do all kinds of things for you in the future. How do you pick those classes? Ah, now come back to the list that I asked you to make earlier. Are there classes that aren't in your major, aren't in your minor, maybe aren't honors classes, that may feed an identity and feed those important things that you listed before? Yeah, so how do we fit those things in? What experiences do we choose, a la carte or for our olive cart, to add to that as well? Will you do national student exchange and study at a different school in the US? What about study abroad? Study abroad is one of the biggest opportunities that colleges with, uh, with a study abroad program offer. Absolutely amazing. But it cuts in on some of those others. You're going to have to be gone from family longer. It may shift what classes you can take if you study abroad. 
So how do you choose those? How do you choose those extracurricular activities, whether it's sports, whether it's clubs you do, whether it's volunteer work? Volunteer work may get you no credit in class. It may not be part of the competitions that you're looking at, but it may feed something else that was on that list. So in terms of how um, we prepare for school, these are the things I want you to remember about the academy because it is a special place. It is a place where you get to choose your identities all over again. And you get to create those yourself. It's a little more anonymous, especially at a bigger school. You have a little more power to do that. So pick those carefully. But also in the way that you compete. With whom are you going to compete? Because the other part is the people you're not competing with, you can cooperate with and create alliances in that way. So who do you align yourself with at school? Who do you compete with? How do you seek those goals you're looking for that feed that identity that you find yourself? And so ultimately, one of the things that you may be asked to do in this class or other honors classes is a four-year plan. What am I going to do? What opportunities do I want to uh, participate in to feed those identities that I'm looking for? Okay. So those are the things to remember from what I talked about tonight. Identity, competition, and your olive cart. Questions from me? And where, who are the four that I had ice cream with? I'm going to call you out. You four knew what the academy was. Not one of them raised their hands. Look at him now. Oh, I would, I'm sorry, I thought you were somebody else. I went at that table. I don't, my apologies. Okay. Thank you.